can you tell me which one of the image will belong to tuberculous meningitis can anyone tell me which one of the image will belong to tuberculous meningitis because the topic sometimes will be covered in microbiology as well as in radiology too there are certain telltale symptoms and signs as well as radiological findings with respect to meningitis with respect to encephalitis so based on the imaging pattern can anyone tell me so what are all the corresponding diagnosis you can offer for imaging 1 imaging 2 imaging 3 and imaging 4 leave alone this fourth one leave image 1 2 3 can anyone try yes what is the first image in first image you could see some hyper intense signals involving the temporal lobe as you all know whenever you see any case of temporal lobe encephalitis unless otherwise proved in pediatric age group you are dealing with a case of herpes encephalitis you are dealing with a case of herpes encephalitis i repeat temporal lobe encephalitis in pediatric age group unless otherwise proved is herpetic encephalitis and then let us go to imaging 2 so what are what is the so common abnormality that you can see in this imaging what is the abnormality that you can see in this second image what happens the lateral ventricle gets dilated the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle is dilated the third ventricle is dilated as well as the fourth ventricle is dilated whenever you see any case of meningitis along with a tetrahydrocephalus or even in fact hydrocephalus unless otherwise proved you are dealing with a case of tuberculous meningitis i repeat temporal lobe encephalitis is equal to herpetic encephalitis any child with a fever seizures everything you take an mri and mri revealing an hydrocephalus particularly tetrahydrocephalus you need to think in terms of tuberculous meningitis let me go to the third picture so what is the so obvious thing that can be visualized in this imaging the third one what is the obvious thing that is that can be visualized in the third image this one what is the so much of abnormality you could see hyper intense signals so where do you see hyper intense signals here so you could see hyper intense signals in so what are all the deeper structures of the brain what are all the deeper structure of the brain so you could see hyper intense signals in the thalamus as well as in the basal ganglia so i can say this encephalitis predominantly involving encephalitis predominantly involving thalamus as well as basal ganglia when you are when you have a picture suggestive of meningitis or encephalitis and it shows an hyper intense signals involving your thalamus and basal ganglia it is nothing but japanese encephalitis it is nothing but japanese encephalitis so to summarize to begin with let me say temporal lobe encephalitis unless otherwise proved is herpes encephalitis a case of meningitis with a tetrahydrocephalus is tuberculous meningitis and an acute onset seizures altered sensorium mri showing hyper intense signals involving basal ganglia and thalamus is japanese encephalitis and finally before going to the fourth one let me ask my medicine faculty santosh to add any further points with respect to these scenarios in adults santosh? okay so uh, in adults also if you have a temporal lobe uh, encephalitis we would think of herpes simplex itself and so is the case of je virus so there's no major difference in terms of imaging yeah only point i would like to add is in adult practice the presence of basal exudates is an extremely important clue for the diagnosis of uh, tubercular meningitis because we may not see patients coming with the hydrocephalus they present quite before the onset of hydrocephalus in in pediatric age group maybe it's common to see patients presenting at the stage of hydrocephalus but in adults it's quite rare so the important leading clue would be the development of or presence of the basal exudates okay. for the tubercular meningitis so our medicine faculty santosh had added one valid point what is that point 
basal exudates or exudates are characteristic of tuberculous meningitis in case of adults they can able to say they could say they have fever they have headache they have photophobia everything so what will happen invariably you will take an mri even before the onset of hydrocephalus but as far as tuberculous meningitis in pediatric age group is concerned almost majority of the cases are detected only in stage 2 and stage 3 of illness because of the non specific manifestations of tuberculous meningitis in pediatric age group so to start with why adults are diagnosing tuberculous meningitis with the basal exudates alone whereas in pediatrics we detect tuberculous meningitis only after onset of an hemiplegia only after onset of an hydrocephalus let me explain you why it is so in case of pediatric age group particularly <clears throat> what are all the risk factors with respect to tuberculous meningitis in pediatric age group <coughs> excuse me whenever any case of subacute meningoencephalitis what do you mean by subacute meningoencephalitis encephalitis means you have fever altered sensorium everything subacute means it occurs over a period of days or it occurs over a period of weeks in pediatric age group unless otherwise proved a case of subacute meningoencephalitis you need to have high suspicion for tuberculous meningitis the first and foremost question that we ask in pediatric is whether is there any household contact any father mother grandmother grandparents are taking ATT for pulmonary tuberculosis point number 1 and whether there is previous history of any measles in the recent past because you all know that measles will lead to an immunodeficiency status young age tuberculous meningitis are so common between 6 months to 2 years of age again because of due to immunological memory and due to poor immunological development in the first one and a half years of life and as you all know protein energy malnutrition can predispose to many illness one such illness is tuberculous meningitis and with respect to pathology or with respect to microbiology people used to ask what is the focus that is present in the brain parenchyma that can lead on to that can lead on to seedling of tuberculous bacilli in the brain so what is that focus called as that focus is called as rich focus r i c h rich focus as we discussed already why tuberculous meningitis is getting missed in the first initial stage of illness it is because of this one tuberculous meningitis usually occur in three stages stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 what is the stage 1 this stage one usually can last up to 1 to 4 weeks see whenever when you will suspect a case of meningitis whenever you have fever altered sensorium seizures along with focal neurological deficit you will think in terms of a meningitis but what happens in case of tuberculosis meningitis as we discussed already it is a case of subacute meningoencephalitis so what happens in the initial periods of illness it is highly non specific stage this non specific stage of tuberculous meningitis can last up to 1 to 4 weeks this is called prodromal stage in this prodromal stage there are no signs and symptoms suggestive of meningitis per se because the manifestations are mainly non specific and as like any other chronic illness you will get fever weight loss appetite loss with or without altered sensorium headache see in a small child 6 months to 2 years how it is possible to identify this altered sensorium and a small child cannot complain of photophobia a small child cannot complain of headache in particular regression of milestones what do you mean by regression of milestone sir my child was able to walk my child can able to see my child can able to hear suddenly all those milestones will go for regression the child suddenly cannot see cannot hear or cannot walk so this is called regression of milestones at times stagnation of milestone the milestones will not progress further because of this prodromal stage of illness majority of pediatric tuberculosis meningitis is missed in this 
stage but in this stage it can be easily picked up in a case of adults because they could be able to complain the symptoms that they get what is stage 2 typical stage 2 is a stage 2 of meningitis it is very very typical so you will get the neck stiffness you will get seizures you will get focal neurological <coughs> deficit and finally, even at times, some of the cases were not diagnosed to have tuberculous meningitis and not started on ATT during the stage, leading on to decerebrate rigidity, leading on to sequelae, tu tuberculous meningitis sequelae. But majority of the pediatric TB cases are diagnosed in stage 2 of illness. Stage 3 means neglected. It is missed by the person who had seen the case previously. And it was told already. What is the most common? When I need to consider a case of subacute meningoencephalitis in case of a in, in favor of a tuberculous meningitis. Very, very, very simple. Any case of subacute meningoencephalitis. What do you mean by subacute meningoencephalitis? Fever lasting for more than week, days to weeks. Altered sensorium lasting for more than days to weeks along with one of the following. In those cases, when you suspect tuberculous meningitis and when you take an MRI, you can find the following things. So what are all the following things? One, you can find a hydrocephalus. Two, because of tuberculous meningitis is prone to produce vasculitis as a result of which infarct can occur, infarct leading on to hemiplegia. And then any case of hydrocephalus can lead on to cranial nerve palsy. If, the le if left untreated, the child can go for decerebrate posture and increased intracranial tension can lead to optic atrophy. Remember, along with the hydrocephalus, infarct, basal exudate, you can find the tuberculomas. So, four special features of tuberculous meningitis in children. What are all they? As Santosh told, one is basal exudate. One is basal exudate. That's why you will get communicating hydrocephalus. First point is basal exudate. Second point is hydrocephalus. Third point is infarct. As a result of which you will get hemiplegia. Fourth point is tubercloma. I repeat, these four points are characteristic of tuberculous meningitis. And you all know, in any case of suspicious meningitis, whether it is TB or bacterial the first and foremost thing is rule out intracranial tension or reduce the intracranial tension after reducing the intracranial tension you need to do a csf analysis so what are all the characteristic features of uh, cs uh, tuberculous meningitis in the respect to csf so what are all the things we see in csf point number one cells cells will be around five usually around 500 cells per cubic millimeter in that predominantly it will be lymphocytes whereas predominantly it will be neutrophils in case of bacterial meningitis here predominantly it will be lymphocytes second point protein will be elevated but not sky high to the ex extent of acute bacterial meningitis and invariably sugar will be low but not as low to the extent of an acute bacterial meningitis so cells around 500 cells per cubic millimeter, predominantly it is of lymphocytic predominant with a minimally elevated protein and sugar minimally decreased, not very much decreased. When sugar is very much decreased, we will think in terms of other diagnosis apart from tuberculous meningitis. As we discussed already, what are all the four imaging points that are suggestive of TB meningitis? basal exudate, hydrocephalus, tuberculoma, infarct. So what is the investigation of choice? Majority of our friends will vote for smear for AFP, but it is highly non-sensitive. You can't get that kind of smear positivity in tuberculous meningitis. So what we do right now is, one is PCR-based analysis. What is PCR-based analysis? PCR-based analysis is CB0. CB0 means what? Cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification test. So this is a PCR-based test. At times, we do MGIT. What is called MGIT? Mycobacterial growth inhibitor tube system, which is nothing but a liquid culture. So what are all the investigations? Direct investigations we do? 
one is smear for AFP, second one is CB0, third one is MGAT. Point of care diagnosis is CB0. Apart from that, old school of thought says that you can get cobweb formation. But we don't see practically in pediatric cases. But remember, cobweb formation is a feature of tuberculous meningitis. What is the treatment? Normally, you will give six months of ATT in case of non-tuberculous cases, non-meningitis cases. For example, when you get pulmonary tuberculosis, when you get uh, TB pleural effusion, when you get TB abdomen, when you get TB cervical adenopathy, in all those cases, you will give six months of ATT. So two months of daily HRZE plus four months of HRE daily. But in case of tuberculous meningitis, it is not six months duration. You need to give 12 months of ATT. Two months of intensive phase, which doesn't differ much from uh, non-meningitis cases. Whereas you need to give 10 months of daily isoniacid, rifampicin and ethambutol. So the total duration of ATT in case of tuberculous meningitis in pediatric age group, I repeat one year. Remember, TB is more prone to produce basal exudate because of the presence of thick gelatinous exudate in the basal brain leading to hydrocephalus. TB is a disease where infection as well as inflammation plays a havoc in brain. As a result of which, along with the ATT, you need to give steroids for about 8 weeks. Steroid is must. And as we discussed already, majority of the cases will present with hydrocephalus as a result of which invariably we patient will be 10 in almost all cases if it is detected in the stage of hydrocephalus. Even when it is detected very rarely in case of stage 1, by about 8 weeks we used to take an MRI to rule out an ongoing developing hydrocephalus. At that instant also we can do ventriculoperitoneal shunt. Remember when it is detected in prodromal stage there will not be any morbidity, there will not be any mortality. But when you detect in stage 2 in case of pediatrics 80% will survive. In that 80%, 50% will have sequelae. And third point, in stage 3, 50% morbidity and 80%, 80% morbidity and 50%, only 50% will survive. In that 80% will have a sequelae in the form of weakness or optic atrophy or a cranial nerve deficit. And as we discussed already, the complications are one is hydrocephalus, second is optic neuritis, third one is epilepsy. Some survivors are suffering from intellectual disability and because of the thick arachnoiditis in and around the optic nerve, there can be chances for blindness and by involvement of hypothalamus or pituitary gland, it can also lead to endocrinopathy. So to summarize, subacute meningoencephalitis is a feature of tuberculous meningitis. Suspect any case of subacute encephalitis presenting with hemiplegia. Third, basal exudate, tetrahydrocephalus, infarct, as well as uh, tubercloma are features of tuberculous meningitis in imaging. Lymphocytic predominant, the point of care test is CB0. If negative, you need to go for liquid culture, that is your MGIT. The treatment part not only includes ATT, but also steroids. VPCN will be required in majority of the cases. One year of ATT and it is not six months as we give in case of non-meningitis tuberculosis. Over to you, Santosh. Okay, so guys, only few more points that you need to know. Like sir has given you a very succinct and a beautiful review of the tubercular meningitis. I will add a few points with respect to adult medicine practice. Number one, sir has given you the risk factors for tubercular meningitis. But when it comes to adults, there are two more extra risk factors we need to remember. Number one, diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is an important risk factor in adults for tubercular meningitis. And number two, the retrovirus or the HIV infection. In fact, a repeatedly asked MCQ is, what is the most common opportunistic infection in adult HIV patients? And the answer should be tuberculosis, which includes both pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis. And it is not unusual to see HIV patients presenting with the tubercular meningitis. 
Okay. Now, the, another point we need to note here is an HIV individual developing tubercular meningitis may not present to us with the signs of meningeal irritation. The signs of meningeal irritation may be absent in those patients and merely being aware that you are dealing with a case of HIV, right? you need to be aware that you might have a patient with the meningitis. So high index of suspicion is extremely important for the diagnosis. You cannot rely on the clinical signs in those individuals. Even in diabetic, diabetic patients, sometimes the signs of meningeal irritation may be absent. So we should be aware about it. Okay. So that is one point. Then uh, with respect to the clinical features, sir told you that patients might develop infarct. Now, when we see, see in a pediatric age group, if you see an infarct or a patient who presented with hemiplegia or focal deficits, tuberculosis obviously uh, ranks quite high in the differential diagnosis. But for an adult patient, if someone comes with hemiplegia, stroke is the number one differential diagnosis, right? But there are certain clues to make you think tuberculosis as a possible cause. The clue is the infarct will be located in area called as watershed area. So we see watershed infarct. Now you might ask me, what is that watershed infarct? See, we all know the MCA territory, ACA territory and PCA territory of blood supply. And we, we also know that in adult, if there is a vascular incident causing the uh, like infarct, then it is most likely going to be in the MCA territory. Rarely we would see ACA territory infarct and sometimes in the PCA. But those areas which are overlapped by between these two well-defined vascular territories, those areas are called as watershed areas. Okay. And tuberculosis basically causes small vessel vasculitis in the CNS. So those, uh, those overlap areas are supplied by the smaller branches of the uh, major blood vessels like MCA or ACA. Those smaller branches are supplying those watershed areas. And because tuberculosis causes the uh, small vessel vasculitis of the CNS, it can cause watershed infarct. So if you have a patient whose uh, stroke features do not fit into, let me say, MCA or ACA, right? you cannot anatomically explain that suspect tuberculosis in those patients. Okay, so that is one clue. Now, with respect to the, the lumbar puncture, right? Coab webs, we do often see in, when it comes to adult tubercular meningitis. So that is one difference. And then number two, uh, sir has already told you that we do see low sugars, but very low sugar is unusual. So very low sugar in adult should prompt towards the bacterial meningitis. And sometimes I repeatedly tell in my classes that sometimes your CSF, if it is a bacterial meningitis, the sugars can be zero. Sugars can be zero in bacterial, but in tubercular, it is low, but not zero. But there is one challenge here when it comes to adult medicine. See, in the pediatric age group, the diabetes mellitus uh, incidence is extremely low, right? It's only about the type 1 diabetes mellitus or a certain other inherited forms. But for adult patients, nowadays, even 30 plus, the prevalence of diabetes mellitus type 2 is extremely high. And the blood sugars influence our CSF sugar levels. So here in adult practice, we cannot define, okay, the blood sugar, uh, the CSF sugar level, this is the upper limit of normal. Anything less than this can be called as low. Now, in adult practice... Simultaneous we, blood sugar and CSF sugar. Yes, we yes, sir. So we have to always draw the blood sugar also simultaneously, right? When you're doing the lumbar puncture. And when it is less than two thirds of the blood sugar values, then we would say the CSF sugars are low. Normally, it is around two thirds of the blood sugar values. When it is less than that, we can say it is low. So that is one more point I wanted to add. In terms of management, yes, it is safe. One year of the uh, uh, anti-tubercular treatment, the same combination. Those obviously will be based on the patient's weight. Steroids we will give even in adult practice because uh, steroids are extremely important to prevent the development of sequelae. The steroid preferred is dexamethasone, 0.4 milligrams per kg. Okay, and after the eight weeks therapy, we will quickly taper it off. Now, what we routinely do is when patient is in the hospital, we give in the parenteral form or injectable form. And once he's ready for discharge, we can continue with the oral dexamethasone or if the oral dexamethasone is not convenient, we can also consider prednisolone at the time of discharge and at the end of eight weeks of therapy we start tapering and whenever feasible we taper and stop so that's it about the adult tubercular meningitis so over to you sir for the bacterial meningitis so with respect to pregnancy with respect to steroid therapy in uh, pediatric tuberculosis meningitis we often use prednisolone one to four mg per kg over a period of four to eight weeks we avoid dexamethasone in view of significant uh, glucocorticoid activity so Cushingoid features, long acting, that's why we avoid in pediatric age group. In pediatric, prednisolone is the drug of choice. Only during hospital stay, 
we use dexamethasone. Otherwise, at the time of discharge, prednisolone over a period of four to eight weeks is the drug of choice. Okay. okay. Shall we go to acute bacterial? Yes, sir. We'll proceed. Okay, Santosh. See, as far as acute bacterial meningitis are concerned, see, for each and every time you need to think in terms of your a clinical case because you are going to face so many clinical scenarios. You are going to face so many uh, next pattern type of questions. So when will you consider tuberculous meningitis? A yes, subacute fever over a period of weeks, days to weeks, altered sensorium over a period of days to weeks. So this is called subacute meningoencephalitis. So when, when subacute meningoencephalitis, think in terms of TBM. So what happens to uh, the onset and presentation in case of acute bacterial meningitis? It is very, 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 very acute. That means what? Sir, my son, my daughter has been suffering from fever, not speaking, altered sensorium for the past two to three days. Suddenly, he developed a seizure this morning. So this is called acute episode. Majority of acute bacterial meningitis will present with the fever as well as convulsion within the within one week of onset of fever. Majority of the time by about third day or fourth day of fever. That's why acute onset fever, altered sensorium, toxic child. Think in terms of a bacterial meningitis. Again, what are all the risk factors in pediatric age group? These are all the things very, very common. Male sex, poverty. I don't know whether you need to remember all those things because whatever disease you say, this poverty, overcrowding, all will come. With respect to hip, bacterial colonization of nasopharynx. But after the introduction of hemophilus influenza vaccination in the year 2012 in almost all states of India, the incidence of meningitis due to hemophilus influenza has drastically decreased. And uh, what else? What else? Remember, CSF rhinorrhea can be a cause for recurrent meningitis. And whenever you have a pylonidal sinus involving the basal skull, can be a predisposing factor in case of kids, children, organisms. With respect to organism, definitely there is a difference with respect to the age of onset. Young child, between up to three months, it is always gram-negative bacilli. What are all the gram-negative bacilli? It can be E. coli, it can be Klebsiella, it can be Pseudomonas, it can be Proteus. Less than three months, if it, if it is a pneumonia, whether it is a case of septicemia or a case of meningitis, always in pediatric, in children less than three months of age, you need to think in terms of gram-negative bacilli. Bacilli. Very, very rarely staph aureus. Very, very rarely group B streptococcus. Even though majority of the theoretical book says that group B streptococci, group B streptococci from the maternal vaginal tract, there are only countable number of cases in India. I don't know whether this group B streptococcus meningitis happens in India at least. It is not so. It is gram-negative bacilli. That's all. Listeria, again, is a very, 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 very least common organism, even though it is told in the book. So as far as your knowledge is concerned, for your level is concerned, whenever someone is asking you, what is the most common cause for meningitis in children less than three months, you need to say gram-negative bacilli. Either it is E. coli followed by Klebsiella. Rarely it can be due to pseudomonas. Second, between classically, between two months to two years, between two months to two years, Previously, it was hemophilus influenza, but now it has been replaced by pneumococci and very few cases of meningococci. And again, pneumococci, pneumocil, PCV10 has been introduced a year back in uh, at 6 weeks and 14 weeks and a booster is given at 9 months. That's why pneumococcal vaccine has also been introduced in many states across India as a result of which the incidence of pneumococcal meningitis will also come down. But as far as your level is concerned right now, between three months and three years, majority of the times it is due to pneumococcal meningitis. Meningococcal meningitis is very, very rare. If you get gram-negative diplococci in CSF analysis, you need to rule out complement defect. Unlikely to occur in a case of immunocompetent child. 
I repeat, meningococcal meningitis means you need to rule out late complement pathway defect. Late complement pathway means C5B to 9. All cases of meningococcal meningitis should have undergone complement assay before discharge. That is the mandatory rule. And more than three year, two to three years also, majority of them it is due to pneumococci. Rarely I told you meningococci. So together, less than three months gram-negative bacilli, more than three months pneumococci is the bug which causes meningitis in pediatric age group. What happens? As I told you already, it is acute in onset. Fever, headache, photophobia, altered sensorium, convulsion, neck stiffness, which all you know. It can occur in this stage. Whether you need to know any MCQs, I really don't know. Not much MCQs with respect to clinical features. You all know it is very fast in onset as a result of which hydro, as a result of which increased intracranial tension is more common here also. And whenever you see any cases of fever with altered sensorium, always look at the heart rate, look at the BP. Because whenever you see a combination of bradycardia, hypertension, in case of children less than 18 months, bulging fontanelle, always think there is an underlying intracranial tension before proceeding towards CSF analysis, reduce the intracranial tension. <clears throat> what are other signs? Sixth nerve palsy, as you all know, any case of intracranial tension can lead to false localizing sign that is involvement of sixth nerve. So what is the triad of uh, raised intracranial tension? Bradycardia, hypertension, as well as breathing abnormalities. And another MCQ, whenever you see any case of fever with shock with petechial rash, I repeat, fever with shock with petechial rash, rule out meningococcal meningitis. You all know that is called as water out Fredrickson syndrome. CSF analysis in case of bacterial meningitis is very, 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 very typical. So what are all the features? It is very turbid. I repeat, it is turbid, purulent, pus you can get from during CSF tap. <clears throat> Remember, in tuberculous meningitis, majority of them is due to lymphocytes. Here it is neutrophilic predominant. And sugar, very high sky level compared to tuberculous meningitis. With respect to protein, with respect to sugar, very, very low. I repeat, cells are very high, predominantly neutrophils. Proteins are very high. Sugars are very, very low. As my friend Santosh told, it can be zero also. Very low sugars, acute onset fever with altered sensorium. Think in terms of acute bacterial meningitis. And what is the investigation of choice? You can do gram staining. If you get, you can get gram negative bacilli or you can get gram positive cocci. It, you can, you can, with respect to cocci, you can, it can be either gram positive cocci or gram negative diplococci. Gram positive cocci is pneumococcus. Gram negative diplococci is your meningococcal infection. Meningococcus. So you can do not only gram staining, you can do cultures, you can do latex agglutination tests. And recently, majority of the investigations are detected with the help of PCR analysis. Right. So, you all know that tuberculous meningitis had produced so much of chronic complications. In the same way, acute bacterial meningitis, two complications are very, very important. See, you are treating a case of acute bacterial meningitis with the zone. Let me say, what are what is the drug of choice? So, zone, septrioxone is the drug of choice. It will cover hemophilus influenza. It will cover pneumococci. It will cover pneumococci. In case of doubt, a combination of zone and vancomycin can be given. But majority of the cases will require only zone because it covers hemophilus influenza and it will cover your pneumococcus and it will cover your pneumococcus wherever in places where pneumococcal resistant to penicillin is high you add a combination of zone septrioxone and vancomycin but in india pneumococcal resistant to penicillin is less as a result of it septrioxone alone is sufficient in case of suspected bacterial meningitis above three months of age group Right. What else? So what are all the complications? 
whenever any case of acute onset meningitis due in the course of antibiotic should is not showing fever defervescence always go for imaging because it can it can lead to subdural effusion or it can be due to subdural empyema in those cases apart from antibiotics you need to drain that subdural abscess or subdural effusion so then only fever will reduce if those subdural empyema progresses you can get brain abscess you just continue the medicine they will resolve most of the times very very rarely infarct and hydrocephalus i repeat infarct and hydrocephalus are characteristic features of your tuberculous meningitis whereas subdural empyema brain abscess and deafness sensory neural deafness are features of acute bacterial meningitis as we discussed already for pneumococci ceftriaxone alone in cases where resistant is seen you can add vancomycin even meningococci will also respond to ceftriaxone in children less than 3 weeks i repeat in children less than 3 weeks since esbl organisms are so common if the child is not responding to third generation cephalosporin you need to consider carbapenem such as imipenem i repeat in children less than 3 months you can start third generation cephalosporin if it is not responding you need to go for carbapenem such as meropenem what is the duration of antibiotic 21 days in case of gram negative bacilli whereas for hemophilus influenza and meningococci 7 days whereas in case of pneumococci 14 days i repeat for hemophilus influenza and meningococci 7 days for pneumococci 14 days and for gram negative bacilli 21 days is the drug of choice very very important point to note always a single dose of dexamethasone should be started along with the antibiotic i repeat should be started with the first dose of antibiotic because it is going to reduce the incidence of sensory dural deafness that is so common in bacterial meningitis particularly due to hemophilus influenza so what are all the preventive measures you can have hemophilus influenza vaccine is available meningococcal vaccine is available both are available under government setup national immunization schedule includes pneumococci and hemophilus influenza but national immunization schedule doesn't include meningococcal vaccine that can be given from 2 years that can be given from 2 years so hemophilus influenza it is given as pentavalent vaccine at 6 weeks 10 weeks and 14 weeks as pentavalent vaccine pneumococcal vaccine is given at 6 weeks 14 weeks and then booster at the ninth month meningococcal i repeat it is not covered under national immunization schedule prevention is there any prevention a child has suffered from meningitis okay is there any preventive measure prophylaxis one more household contact sibling is there with respect to hemophilus no prevention pneumococcal no prevention but with respect to meningococcal meningitis the sibling or contacts can be given rifampicin this is often asked question rifampicin 10 mg per kg per dose twice daily for two days particularly in cases of children living with or getting treatment for meningococcal meningitis i repeat acute bacterial meningitis or acute in onset less than 3 months gram negative bacilli more than 3 months pneumococcal meningitis meningococcal meningitis presents with fever purpuric rash and shock gram negative diplococci always rule out complement pathway defect in meningococcal meningitis mri only in cases of children who are showing focal neurological deficit or fever not improving with antibiotic to look for brain abscess or subdural effusion in those cases you need to put a drainage antibiotic ceftriaxone alone is sufficient in children more than 3 months in children less than 3 months you need to give ceftriaxone if not responding go for carbapenem with respect to uh, meningococcal the same ceftriaxone will be sufficient 
ड्यूरेशन ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक सेवन डेज फॉर हिप एंड मेनिंगो कॉकल नीमो कॉकल फोर्टीन डेज एंड ग्राम नेगेटिव बेसिली ट्वेंटी वन डेज डेक्सामेथसोन शुड बी गिवन विद द फर्स्ट डोज ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक टू रिड्यूस द इंसिडेंस ऑफ सेंसरी न्यूरल डेफनेस वैक्सीनेशन इज अवेलेबल फॉर हिप नीमो कॉकल आ मेनिंगो कॉकल इज अवेलेबल नॉट इन गवर्नमेंट सेटअप रिफाम्बिसिन प्रोफाइल एक्सेस फॉर चिल्ड्रन हु आर लिविंग विद चिल्ड्रन हु इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम मेनिंगो कॉकल मेनिंजाइटिस ओवर टू यू संतोष okay so guys uh, sir has given you a very beautiful review of the bacterial meningitis but when it comes to adult bacterial meningitis there are certain differences so repeatedly we keep telling that a, a child is not a miniature adult and and the voice versa is also true right an adult is not an expanded child right there are a lot of physiological changes and thus the factors responsible for meningitis also vary so when we talk about risk factors for bacterial meningitis we have to recognize diabetes and even more important alcohol as a risk factor for bacterial meningitis most of the times when you read the questions about bacterial meningitis the examiner tends to mention either patient is alcoholic or the patient is a known case of diabetes mellitus okay that is one point then when it comes to the organisms here is where a lot of difference lies okay so when it comes to adults with bacterial meningitis the most common organism that is isolated from the csf is the pneumococci which accounts for more than 50% of adult bacterial meningitis cases this is the most common organism accounting for more than 50% cases and the second most common organism is meningococci which accounts for more than 25% of the cases so combined together right these two organisms account for totally more than 75% of adult bacterial meningitis cases so going forward when we would discuss about the management of bacterial meningitis so mainly about the more than 3 months it is yeah common pneumococcal followed by yeah. meningococcal that's yeah it. true so yeah so uh, after 3 months onwards i think the same organisms will prevail so going forward when we have to devise a antibiotic policy for empirical treatment of meningitis we have to keep in mind these two organisms right then when it comes to adults again after 55 years of age listeria monocytogenes becomes a common organism listeria monocytogenes becomes a common organism so that is why we will have two different empirical choices for people who are under 55 years of age and people who are above 55 years of age because we need to cover listeria monocytogenes for anyone who is 55 plus like sir said in pediatric practice probably listeria is not that common but in adult practice we have started seeing quite a good number of listeria monocytogenes uh, meningitis in elderly or geriatric population and we have to remember now itself what is the drug of choice for the listeria monocytogenes because you already have a fair idea about how would how would we deal with the pneumococci and meningococci but listeria monocytogenes as sir has written ampicillin is the drug of choice okay so this is the difference now there are there are some more points to note here the staphylococci is also increasingly becoming a common nasty problem in adult meningitis i think even in pediatric practice it should have been becoming a problem these days because of uh, uh, hospital frequent hospital exposure and the other risk factors like ckd diabetes mellitus ihd patient pending good time in hospital staph is not only the concern but even the mrsa is becoming a concern so again when we think of antibiotic policy we have to keep this point in mind okay so this is about the organisms which are commonly responsible for the adult bacterial meningitis now in terms of clinical features and all it's going to be very similar acute onset fever neck rigidity sometimes focal deficits and features of a raised intracranial tension the diagnosis will follow the similar path the only point i would like to add is a prerequisite for doing a lumbar puncture you need to be sure that patient has got Uh, alarmingly high intracranial pressure because if that is the case if you do a lumbar puncture you might cause the brain stem herniation and that can lead to catastrophic result so you need to rule out the raised icd how can we do that there are two ways either you can do a fundoscopy to see if there is a papilla edema present or you can do a ct or mri now if the examiner is asking you which one is preferred remember ct or mri is preferred but it may not be practical in all cases especially in country like india where there is lot of resource limitation so what we do in practice is the young individuals with no other comorbidities and who do not have overt clinical features of raised icp in them we rely on the papilla edema or fundus examination anyone who is elderly who has other comorbidities right or there are suspicions of the or symptoms suspicious of raised icp in those cases you don't have a choice you have to do a imaging 
right? So young individuals with no overt signs of raised ICT and no other comorbidities, you can do the fundus examination for papillary edema. In other, in a, otherwise all other cases, CT or MRI should be done. Okay. Now the question is, what if I find significantly elevated ICT? There is a gross papillary edema or the radiologist says that there is elevated uh, intracranial pressure, there is cerebral edema. In those cases, we should generally institute anti-edema measures, empirically treat with antibiotics, and then later on, you can go ahead with the lumbar puncture. You can't take the risk with the brainstem herniation. Okay, that is one point. Now, coming to the antibiotics of choice. Number one, in all cases of the meningitis, with even a slight suspicion of meningitis, you have to initiate the empirical antibiotics because every hour delay in initiation of antibiotics contributes to mortality as well as morbidity. So you cannot afford to delay. I, I mean, adult practice, we also tell that if lumbar puncture is also going to take time, then don't waste your time there. Start empirical antibiotics. That's an extremely important point because otherwise what happens is, I've seen this happening in medical colleges where uh, only intern is posted in a peripheral unit and a suspected meningitis case comes in the night, is not confident of doing a lumbar puncture. So the patient is waiting next, till the next day morning for rounds for a decision to start antibiotic. That should not be the case. If you suspect that patient has got meningitis, if you can get the lumbar puncture done and then start antibiotics, that is beautiful. If not possible, go ahead with the empirical initiation of antibiotics. Now coming to what antibiotics? As Sir told, three years plus, right? Pneumococci and meningococci are the common organisms of concern. And for that, in adult practice, we will generally treat them with ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. As Sir told in pediatrics, vancomycin may be a choice when needed. But in adult practice, it's a common uh, practice to give vancomycin because even the pneumococci that we see right, affecting the adults are mostly acquired, uh, not only from the community, but sometimes they're acquired from the hospital and the resistance is slightly higher. So we generally give them a combination of ceftriaxone and vancomycin if the age of the individual is less than 55 years. If the age of the individual is more than 55 years, to this cocktail of two antibiotics, we add one more that is going to be ampicillin. If more than 55 years, we add ampicillin because listeria monocytogens is an added concern here. Okay. Now, in adult practice, we also encounter one more situation. Sometimes patients develop meningitis after recent hospital exposure or hospitalization or penetrating head injury. In those patients, two organisms are extremely concerning. One is MRSA, which is anyway covered if we are giving the vancomycin. But the second organism is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is in fact the second most common uh, hospital acquired infection in, in adults. Right, So Pseudomonas becomes a concern. Now we need to cover the antibiotics for Pseudomonas and like what antibiotics we can use. So we can either think of using a fourth generation cephalosporin or the carbapenems. Among the carbapenems, meropenem is the preferred carbapenem because of its excellent blood-brain barrier penetration. And if you're using the cephalosporin, we would think of septazidine. Agar hum septazidine de rahe, to should we give septriaxone? No, right? So what we do is we eliminate septriaxone. In that place, we bring in septazidine or meropenem. Vancomycin rahega, ampicillin will continue. So that is a combination of three antibiotics if patient has a recent hospitalization or a penetrating head injury. When it comes to duration of antibiotic therapy, generally we say 7 to 14 days. I'm not going into organism specific duration because what we do in adult practice is after completing the 7 days of antibiotics, we repeat a lumbar puncture to establish the sterility of CSF. If the CSF is now sterile, the CSF abnormalities have re regressed to normalcy, then you can stop the antibiotics. If not, we need to continue for 7 days more. That is the usual adult practice. Before you close the treatment saying that, okay, I'm done and dusted with the treatment of the adult bacterial meningitis, a normal CSF should be documented. Okay. So this is about the management duration, 7 to 14 days, depending on the CSF result that is done on seventh day of the antibiotic therapy. Steroids, yes, in adult practice also we give steroids because the sensory neural deafness and other focal deficits are common sequelae in adult practice also. So we give steroids. The point to note here is the steroid should be given either 15 to 20 minutes before the first dose of the antibiotic or along with the first dose of antibiotic and it has no benefit if given after the first dose of antibiotic. That is a point to note. Why this is important? Because if you go back and read any of the standard textbooks of the bacterial meningitis, the pathogenesis is more about the inflammatory cascade activated by the replicating bacteria and not bacteria directly causing the damage. So if 
we give the antibiotics which are bactericidal and they cause the bacterial cell wall rupture then the body will mount much more stronger immune response so all those inflammatory cytokines will be produced in larger quantities and the chances of sequelae increases so you need to tame your immune system before you start killing the bacteria that is why either 15 to 20 minutes before the first dose or along with the first dose but not after clear then the duration of these steroids Sir said two years for pediatrics. In adults, generally, we give it for four, uh, sorry, two days for pediatrics. In adults, we give for four days. The steroids are given for four days. So that is a little a subtle difference there. Two days in pediatrics, four days in adults. So I think this kind of summarizes all the information you need to know about the bacterial meningitis. And when you study side by side, right, comparing how the adult meningitis profile and the management is different from pediatrics, probably you will remember things better. Right. So with this, uh, I will pass on the baton to uh, Sir for the uh, herpes simplex virus encephalitis. Okay. Thank you, Santosh. So we have discussed about tuberculosis meningitis as well as acute bacterial meningitis. See, there are so many causes for viral meningoencephalitis. It doesn't mean that your are herpes, herpes, herpes simplex. It doesn't mean that your Japanese encephalitis. So many viruses can cause, but among that. The most common cause for sporadic viral meningoencephalitis is herpetic encephalitis, whereas Japanese encephalitis usually occur in endemic region. So herpetic simplex encephalitis is the most common sporadic encephalitis, viral encephalitis in children. So what is the manifestation here? Here it usually mimics complex partial seizure. So Herpes simplex involves your temporal lobe. As a result of which, children usually present with fever, altered sensorium, and behavioral abnormalities because of the involvement of the temporal lobe. That's why it is often misdiagnosed as or misinterpreted as complex partial seizure. I repeat, fever with altered sensorium, with altered behavioral pattern is more in favor of an herpes simplex encephalitis because of the involvement of the temporal lobe. I repeat, most common cause for sporadic viral encephalitis is herpes. It mimics complex partial seizures. Why it is so? Because Apart from fever, headache, these are all common things. Fever, headache, altered sensorium, focal neurological disease. These are all for any kind of brain involvement. The most characteristic feature are two. One is behavioral abnormalities and as well as hallucination. They are so common in temporal lobe encephalitis, otherwise known as herpes encephalitis. Here, protein is very mildly elevated. Yeah, it must be around less than 100 or less than 150 milligram per deciliter. Neither affects your neither affects your sugar. Sugar will be minimally low. Protein will be minimally high. Cells will be minimally high. As such, majority of the time, CSF analysis with respect to cells, protein, sugar will not be altered much. But a great clue in case of Herpes, suspected herpes implex encephalitis is presence of RBCs. Majority of the time, when you see RBCs in CSF, people will think in terms of a traumatic lumbar puncture. It is not so. Whenever you see RBCs in a child with low-grade fever, altered sensorium, much of behavioral abnormalities, not much elevated protein, not much low sugar or not much elevated cells, but plenty of RBCs in CSF. Please forget about your traumatic lumbar puncture. Most probably it is due to herpes simplex encephalitis. But people may argue it can also be due to traumatic. But how to prove? Do I need to do gram staining? Less likely. Any viral studies? Less likely. Majority of the times your viral encephalitis are detected with the help of doing CSF PCR analysis. I repeat, majority of viral meningoencephalitis are detected with CSF PCR analysis. It is the investigation of choice right now. As we discussed already, even in the beginning, hyperintel signals in the temporal lobe, unless otherwise produce herpes. As a result of which, EEG will reveal 
periodic lateralized epileptic form discharges over the periodic lateralized lateralized towards temporal lobe epileptic form discharges otherwise known as periodic lateralized epileptic form discharges plets usually seen in case of herpes simplex encephalitis as we discussed already temporal lobe signal abnormalities is a manifestation again of hsv encephalitis here it is the csf pcr analysis do not rely on any other diagnosis which are very less sensitive and specific and finally what is the uh, antibiotic uh, antiviral of choice acyclovir how much 20 mg per kilogram per dose thrice daily for about 21 days as santosh mentioned previously in herpes simplex encephalitis by about 14th day we will look for csf analysis whether csf analysis shows hsv or not if it is there another seven days or else we will stop with 14 days of antiviral therapy hsv encephalitis is more prone to produce some kind of sequelae almost less than 40 percent will survive and in that five percent will have, uh, will will survive with some form of disability and there are chances for relapse five percent cases will relapse and again even a single episode of herpes simplex encephalitis in children as well as adults now comes under immunodeficiency whenever you see any case of herpes simplex encephalitis you need to rule out immunodeficiency what is that it is tall like receptor you all know it comes under innate immunity tall like receptor deficiencies are increasingly being observed in case of herpes simplex encephalitis over to you santosh so guys uh, i have nothing specific to add here because all you need to know sir has already covered point to note is there's a slight difference in the way we approach a case of encephalitis in adults because when we see someone presenting with an encephalitis like picture in adults we have metabolic encephalopathies as an extremely important differential diagnosis right so patients with the electrolyte abnormalities uremia ckd so metabolic encephalopathies are an important differential diagnosis so the first step in any suspected case of encephalitis is rule out the other causes for encephalopathy and only then think of the infective encephalitis and when we think of infective encephalitis in adults viruses are the most common cause and generally we don't try to uh, trace the pattern identification or trying to identify the organism because for most patients the blanket treatment is acyclovir so if you have ruled out the metabolic causes for encephalopathy and you're strongly aligned with the diagnosis of an infective encephalitis empirically we start the acyclovir the duration of therapy as sir said will be around 14 to 21 days <clears throat> but parallelly you will make an attempt to see if you can recognize the virus if you have recognized the virus well enough you can document it as a cause like specifically you can say it is herpes simplex encephalitis or a particular xyz virus encephalitis if not it will just become a possible viral encephal encephalitis and a 21 days of acyclovir is given generally in adult practice we don't try to trace the organism or the patterns on the neuroimage that's it sir so uh, over to you then so to conclude what about japanese encephalitis it usually occurs in the endemic areas it is not the common cause for sporadic encephalitis it usually occurs in endemic areas with respect to the agent it is a flavi virus that will be covered under uh, microbiology uh, the vector is culex tritinurinicus usually in areas people living around rice fields pig is the host as far as japanese encephalitis is concerned only one thing you need to remember almost 50 percent will survive 50 percent will die in pediatric age group even in that 50 percent almost all of them will have some form of sequelae in the form of movement disorders because it predominantly involves your basal ganglia is there any specific therapy for japanese encephalitis no is there any specific thing with respect to csf analysis no so imaging will reveal involvement of basal ganglia and the thalamus and again this also will often be detected with the help of pcr analysis 
only supportive management. But here, the government has come up with vaccination in children who are living in endemic region. The vaccine is JE vaccine that is given at 9th month first dose and 15th month second dose. Rest of the things, majority of them are questions with respect to microbiology. With respect to pediatrics, more common in endemic region, involves your basal ganglia and thalamus. Majority of them will die or the survivals will have movement disorder sequelae. PCR analysis is the investigation of choice. No specific treatment, only supportive. <laughs> Prevention by means of JE vaccine at 9th month and 15th month, which comes under national immunization schedule. Over to you, Santosh. Uh, so guys, nothing much to add here from the adult medicine side because it is not that common. It's not a major concern when it comes to adult practice. As Sir told, it is a disease of uh, endemic region, right? So if at all there's a question asked to you, generally examiners will have a tendency to mention that this region is endemic for the JE virus infection or they will mention that particular region. And as Sir told, the encephalitis affecting the basal ganglia and thalamus or what we call as subcortical structures. Nothing more to add, sir. We can progress. Yeah. So recently, we have been getting many cases of scrub typhus encephalitis. You all know, when will you diagnose scrub typhus? Whenever any person with the fever, hepatosplenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, and the telltale marker for any scrub typhus is presence of SHR. Presence of SHR is the telltale sign of many scrub typhus. So, in cases of sub, it usually mimics TBM. Scrub typhus meningitis usually mimics TBM. That's why in any case of tuberculous meningitis, suspicious cases, even this can cause vasculitis, this can cause infarct, this can cause hydrocephalus. Any age group can be affected. When your ATT doesn't work, we'll always search for SR anywhere in the ear lobe, umbilicus, perineum, or in the axle, I will search for SR. If SR is present, we will invariably put the child on doxycycline. The drug of choice for scrub typhus is doxycycline. And the investigation of choice is IgM ELISA. Either in the blood or in the CSF, IgM ELISA is the investigation of choice. And again, with respect to microbiology, larval mite is the one which produces Agent is Orienta Sutsugamushi. I repeat, scrub typhus encephalitis will often mimic tuberculous meningitis. One, SR is the one which is going to give you the clue. Two, third point is doxycycline is the drug of choice. If at all you want to get the diagnosis, IgM, LSI, and CSF are blood. These four points are more than enough with respect to scrub typhus meningoencephalitis. Over to you, Santosh. Uh, nothing more to add, sir. So the drug of choice is same. The clinical features are same. The organism is same. Only only difference would be the adult dose of doxycycline. That's it, sir. Done. And finally, my friend Santosh has told you, in any case of altered sensorium, first in adults, they will rule out other causes of encephalopathy. And our friend told that you need to rule out metabolic encephalopathy. In the same way, in pediatrics, when any case of acute encephalitis, acute encephalitis means fever, altered sensorium in the form of seizures, lethargy, refusal of feeds, anything comes. Always we need to search for any microbiological evidence. It can be TB, it can be scrub typhus, it can be your uh, bacterial or it can be your JE or herpes. In the absence of these microbiological evidence, Fever with the encephalopathy along with classical MRI changes. What is the MRI changes? Let me go back to my first slide. What is the characteristic MRI changes? Look here. You could find numerous white out lesions in the gray white matter junction. Numerous white out lesion in T2 weighted images. In T2 weighted images, whenever you see numerous white out lesion in the gray white matter junction, it is nothing but a case of 
demyelination that can be very much visualized as white matter abnormalities in T2 images, which is so suggestive of acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. Either it can be post viral, such as measles, mumps, flu, varicella. At times, it can be due to atypical infections such as mycoplasma or it can follow vaccines like measles, rabies, yellow fever. The presentation is altered sensorium. And MRA, as I told you, you can see white matter hyperintense signals in gray white matter junction. Here, which is nothing but demyelination. Here, the treatment of choice is not antibiotic or antiviral. It is purely autoimmune due to mimicry, molecular mimicry. Here, the drug of choice is steroids, pulse methylprednisolone. If it is not responding, intravenous immunoglobulin. If it is not responding, remove all those unnecessary antibodies by means of plasma pharesis. Over to you, Santosh. Okay, so uh, acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis, or you can also call it as an autoimmune encephalomyelitis, is also common in adult practice. In adult practice, there's a point to remember because we also know certain other conditions where the CNS demyelination happens, right? So when we talk about demyelinating disorders, we can classify them as the demyelinating disorders of the peripheral nervous system. The classical example is your GB syndrome and the demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system where it can be acute, ADEM, and it can also be chronic where you have this multiple sclerosis, then MOG disorder, and then uh, anti-aquaporin-4 antibody disorders. Now, in adults, it is usually the chronic demyelinating disorders are much more common. And right, to differentiate between the two, you need to remember that the ADEM is a monophasic illness. That means it happens once. The patient will not come back to you with repeated episodes of demyelination. Anyone who is presenting to you with repeated episodes of demyelination is most likely to have either the multiple sclerosis, smog disorder, or anti aquaporin 4, or what you call as Devix disorder. Those are possible if the patient is presenting with multiple episodes. If it is the only episode, then ADEM is a possibility. Okay. Diagnosis, again, we are relying on MRI, just like how Sir told you, right? Mainly, you are looking at the white matter, gray matter junction where you will be seeing the demyelinating lesions. Everything is exactly the same as Sir has projected. So, there is no difference in terms of management. Uh, the management will also be relying on the methylprednisolone pulse dose as the first-line treatment. The usual adult dose is 500 milligrams to 1 gram IV once a day for 3 to 5 days. If that is not helping, we generally think of IVIG or plasma paresis. Now, in the adults, IVIG and plasma paresis are roughly equivalent, so you can go with one of the choices. So there is no uh, staggered approach there because both of them are similar in terms of efficacy. So we go with one of the choices depending on patient's uh, convenience and your practice because some places you may not have the facility for plasma paresis, but you can procure IVIG and give it off. In some, some situations, IVIG turn out to be more expensive than the plasma paresis. So we, we make a decision based on the patient's factors. But the take home messages both are equivalent in terms of efficacy when it comes to adults. Uh, that's it. So my friend had discussed and mentioned one point, MOG. What is that MOG? Antibodies to myelin oligodendrocyte. See, myelin is formed outside nervous system by Schwann cells, whereas myelin inside the central nervous system is formed by oligodendrocyte. Whenever antibodies are formed to this oligodendrocyte, it will lead on to demyelination. So, right now, we have a specific entity called, as my friend mentioned, autoimmune encephalitis. What is the manifestation? Invariably, any one of these manifestations, whenever a child comes with sudden onset mutation, not speaking for the past one or two days, sudden onset movement disorder, sudden onset behavioral disorder, sudden onset autonomic disturbances in the form of hypertension, brady, tachycardias, sudden onset seizures, and you often look for CSF analysis, you often look for pleocytosis, CSF glucose, protein, microbiology, gram staining, PCR analysis, you won't get anything. In the absence of microbiological evidence, you need to go for CSF analysis for antibodies to mock and the most common antibody in case of pediatric age group is 
anti nmda receptor antibody i repeat there are many but to your level anti nmda receptor antibody treatment is one and the same start with pulse methyl prednisolone either iv ig or plasma pheresis long standing chronic cases will require rituximab or to some push okay so nothing more to add the same points to remember for adult practice only point to note here is rituximab is an anti cd20 monoclonal antibody so what it what it does is cd20 is a marker for your b lymphocyte so it is a b lymphocyte suppressant right it is a b lymphocyte depleting agent and when we deplete the b lymphocytes antibodies are produced by b lymphocytes so we are suppressing the antibody production so over to you sir okay and finally remember dengue by itself can directly lead to encephalopathy so how it will look like any case of fever with total count of less than 4000 with a platelet of less than 1.5 lakh along with altered sensorium with a negative crp always think in terms of dengue encephalopathy which has got very grave prognosis santosh do you want to add anything uh i think as a practicing physician i'm most scared of dealing with dengue patients rather than anything else the pyrex of unknown origin own challenge me but dengue definitely because it's an extremely unpredictable immune response from human body which is responsible for majority of the consequences so is dengue encephalopathy and as sir told yes the prognosis is very bad if the patient has developed dengue encephalopathy and finally let us conclude our session with the ray syndrome any child with altered sensorium along with the deranged lft along with acute hepatic failure a normal serum bilirubin i repeat any child with altered sensorium along with acute hepatic failure a normal bilirubin you need to think in terms of ray syndrome it can be predisposed to by children receiving any salicylate previously people used to use aspirin for high grade fever particularly if it is a case of varicella the child is prone for a uh, child is prone for microvascular steatosis mitochondrial damage occur to the liver leading on to fever with the altered sensorium along with acute hepatic failure two things you need to remember one is normal serum bilirubin second point is microvascular steatosis but there are no necrosis or no inflammation again those points will be covered by our pathology faculty in the respective session i think with this we are uh, completing our topic on meningitis viral bacterial uh, tb as well as some encephalopathies i think this would do for our discussion yes. for today santosh is it okay sir i think we have covered all the key points in a succinct detail neither overdoing beyond what is required nor skipping the things which are essential so guys the most important thing here is quick revision so revise the notes and solve the mcqs after the session so that you apply you get the chance to apply what you have learned today and at the same time application reinforces our memory so you will be able to remember things better and one important take home message is whenever you attend an integrated session right try to see through the topics from the integrated perspective so today we have we have had a side by side comparison of the pediatric and adult meningitis cases how they are different so when you see things like how they are different you will also remember things better so the the integrated way of learning is not only making it easier but it is also helping you remember things better and you will be able to reproduce even if you are writing your university paper if you are doing a side by side comparison your answer will uh, come out quite rich because you will objectively write papers rather than just filling the pages with the uh, random sentences so please keep keep in touch with the medic next channel with more such integrated sessions coming up in the coming days ahead tomorrow also i think uh, sharath sir has one more integrated session uh, so you have a integrated session tomorrow right you will be joining ma we will have myopathies if yes we will start by 9 okay so it's an awesome this uh, awesome topic myopathy is an extremely important topic for the entrance exam perspective so let us connect tomorrow and learn about myopathy for now we are signing off guys have a good night see you tomorrow all the best thank you santosh thank you for the team pw bye santosh bye sir bye sir bye students thank you all